we chose this clip because it really shows the complexity of the structure of this film. It begins with um, Maggie's Olympic trials in the summer of 2016, which in reality is about a year after USAG knew about what NASA was doing to uh, some of its elite athletes. We really weren't gonna go public or say anything because we were told that there's an FBI investigation and we could possibly jeopardize it. And also, you know, we didn't want to upset, you know, Steve Penny and Marta Caroli. They knew that Maggie reported Larry Nasser. We had to do exactly what they wanted us to do. You, you know, know, this is this is public footage. It's um, it's uh, you know, Olympic footage that was aired on NBC. And yet, um, from the Nichols family point of view, they're experiencing this thing completely differently than how. Uh, the public is experiencing it. They have this sort of internal um, drama that's going on um, uh, between them and USAG regarding Maggie's complaint about Nasser. And so you're, I think, as, as the public um, sort of experiencing this footage in a completely different way than you would have normally had you watched this on television. And also from the Nichols family perspective, you know, Maggie was this elite athlete. She was second in the world behind Simone Biles. And for many of these competitions in the year leading up to trials, they were treated like, you know, the elite parents and they were followed around by camera crews and treated royally. And they were starting to notice things at Olympic trials that were starting to look a little bit different. Yeah, just a double fall, great landing. Yeah, and because we decided to put Maggie and the Nichols in their own kind of a bubble, their own timeline. I remember when we first cut the scene, we, it was like 15 minutes long. We had tons of other interviews sort of backing up the Nichols, like, yeah, there was some foul play, but, you know, in, in dissecting the film and making it into these two timelines that would eventually merge, the constraint on Maggie's uh, pods or Maggie's timeline was that you could only as a viewer, we could only know what the Nichols knew at the time. You know, we had camera crews following us. You know, even at the America's Cup a couple of weeks prior, we had a camera crew following us throughout the whole arena. But we showed up at Olympic trials and our seats aren't marked. We don't have mics. There's no camera crew following us. And so something was definitely off. Yeah, I mean, I think this scene is a good example. Archival plays such a key role in the film, too. Um, and, you know, we hope in a lot of these scenes where you're looking at Olympic footage or Olympic trial footage in this case, you know, some of that footage may be familiar to people, but, um, you know, seeing the pomp and circumstance and all the marketing that goes around it, um, we hope now you see it in a sort of different light as you realize what a key part all that marketing played in this abuse story. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president and CEO of USA Gymnastics, Steve Penny. Yeah, the other thing I just realized in watching this is that, you know, earlier in the film, we've sort of hopefully trained the audience a little bit to, to like look a little bit under the surface of what's happening in all this glitz and glory. This at least hopefully gives the audience, you know, the license to like, actually realize that maybe there's other things going on under the surface. Well, yeah, you see Steve Penny there, who is the master of ceremonies at the trials, uh, kind of like a Barnum and Bailey sort of salesman type figure, calling out these athletes with, you know, with kind of clever um, preludes to their, to their names. Um, but we know by now that um, he's the guy that's kind of keeping the, the clamp down on any information getting out about Maggie's complaint regarding Nasser. So I think you're, you're right, Don. You're looking at this in a completely different way than you would be a viewer. Allie Raisman! Hey, uh, Jeff, why don't you talk about the, the music in this scene is also really important because um, I think it helps change the tone. We, we kind of suck the sound out of the, the diegetic scene and, and really a lot of this is done with the score. Yeah, I, I love this moment we're actually coming into here. I mean, I've tried my whole life to make that Olympic team and then not making it, even as an alternate. I think I was mentally and physically just ready to move on. There's two places in the, in the scene where we sort of pull back from all the natural sound in the archival and the score plays, this very haunting texture over which a few solo instruments play. 
May is crushed. She had, you know, many things taken away. And how do you accept it? You know, I'm trying to justify and explain, rationalize things to myself. The first time we hear a, a solo French horn sort of echoing the, the heroism of the Olympic kind of sound, and in this cue, the second cue we're on right here, we hear the sound of a, of a solo female voice. And this was something we, we developed early on in our work. Uh, you know, uh, Maggie's story sort of comes and goes throughout the film. And this, this young, uh, young girl's voice, and there's an innocence in that sound, which I really loved, and a personality to it. It also really helps you track her story. After being abused by USAG, by Steve Penny, by Larry Nassar, all I wanted to do is get my child out of there and take her home and hug her and love her. There's an ache to this whole movie in which it's about the loss of innocence um, in a way. You know, these, these young girls have this amazing dream and, you know, this aspirational optimism and it's just sort of it becomes crushed. I try not to think too much about it. I just try to, you know, carry on and hope that they made the right decision for the right reasons. We're heading now into the butting up of the two storylines. So this is Rachel Denhollander uh, speaking in an archive clip to Mark Alicia, one of the indie star reporters who drove down to Louisville to interview her for the first time. And uh, one really amazing asset we had was that archive of material that the indie star had collected themselves when they first started to get into the story of Rachel Den Hollander, Jamie Dancher, and Jessica Howard, who were the first three women to come forward and report Nasser to the journalists. And I just, I love this incredibly vulnerable footage of Rachel as set against in dissonance to the main character interview we do for the film with Rachel, where she is incredibly healthy looking, she's pregnant, she's confident, and the, the, the dissonance between her vulnerability and uh, how thin she was. She describes not being, having been so nervous coming forward. She wasn't able to eat. Her road to healing through coming forward and through reporting uh, and through ga the gathering of all these other women who had similar experiences um, is really quite um, a beautiful thing. So we were very grateful to that, have that asset. Now we're seeing um, Andrea Mumford, who is the police investigator at Michigan State, who gets the call from Rachel Den Hollander about her cr criminal complaint against Nasser. Um, I had asked her, what's the doctor's name? And she said, Larry Nasser. I had heard of him from a 2014 investigation where another survivor had reported that he had sexually assaulted her during medical treatment. But the case was presented to the prosecutor's office and they declined to, to charge it at that time. Athlete A is really the story of the stars aligning where the reporters, the journalists, the lawyers, the criminal investigators, the prosecutors, really all came together at their very specific moment in time to bring down this one uh, guy uh, within USAG. And here we're about to see the footage where um, the police uh, investigator, Andrea Mumford, um, meets Nasser for the first time. And he comes in kind of all uh, sort of cocksured and confident that he's going to be able to squirm out of yet another complaint against him. And you, you watch his body language change in this incredible surveillance footage that police took of the first Nasser questioning. Now, how long have you been doing this technique? I have video from 30 pounds ago. <laughs> and I started asking him about the 2014 investigation. There were certain protocols that were put in place about getting informed consent, having another medical person in the room, wearing gloves. Um, have you had any instances where there hasn't been anyone in the room for an exam? There's, there's, there there would be some, some on occasion, of course. You okay. know what I mean? That just is the way that with medicine is now, it's difficult. Would this ever involve like digital anal penetration? Only if we're doing a um, coccyx, you know, okay. problem. I mean, okay. then if I, if I actually have to fix a coccyx. When we finally got the hard drive filled with little Nasser clips, such as this one, Vaughn, you can talk about sort of the decision to interview Nasser, not for the film, and what role this tape plays. 
Well, certainly his his character comes through, we felt, in the surveillance footage. And I want Don to talk a little bit about the different ways that we edited this scene over time. But the combination, as John was saying, of his body language kind of changes and becomes much more nervous and twitchy over time because Andrea Mumford does not let him lie. She just she just keeps going at him. Yeah, it's it, it's such a satisfying moment in the film because you're you had to basically like let Detective Mumford you wanted to see her like do work her magic with him and turn slowly turn the tables of justice like you're witnessing it happen like if i'm talking to the patient you put yourself being a teenage girl okay all right okay most people that are sexually assaulted uh -huh. are very uncomfortable they don't know what to say okay he would talk about um, medical terminology referencing certain parts of the body and then he would say, oh, you don't need to know all that, or you won't understand all that. Well, the sacral tubers, like, mis there's, it runs from the pubic symphysis, the falciform process, it, it runs, it's like the pelvic floor, okay? okay? You won't understand that, that stuff. So you're really coming in. And I didn't understand all that, but it didn't matter because he still couldn't explain to me how any of those parts or injuries to them would require vaginal penetration to fix. Do you ever get aroused during these exams? This actually is one of the only scenes that got longer in the film because we let this play long enough where you see her give Nasser enough rope to hang himself. So it, it, it's really amazing to like what Bonnie and John were saying, just to watch him come in with his dumb jokes and you know, this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna be leaving here soon, this will take five minutes. And then he, she just like, you know, sinks her claws in him and, and he realizes that he's, he's been caught. He goes from like cocky and relaxed to defensive and completely exposed. And so like last time there will be an investigation. Right. Okay. 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 All right, I'm gonna go grab a card. Imagining how things could have been different if Steve Penny had asked any questions of Nasser, you know, you sort of can imagine this totally different future. It's very powerful too. As we started looking into the Nasser case, we talked to Nasser's lawyer. First thing he said was, you know, this is a very important man and you're potentially going to ruin his reputation here. And so we were very aware of that ourselves. Rachel Den Hollander was just completely credible source. And John Manley and Jamie Dancher were preparing a lawsuit at that time. I like to think of three act structures a lot in a score, and I like the idea of a third act theme, like a piece of music the audience hasn't heard yet that launches them into uh, the end of the movie. Because I felt like this was my third act theme, and this was sort of the this cavalcade of women who, once they saw this first story and Nasser's denial of it, who started to come forward so bravely. And there's, I wanted to create the sense of this momentum. Sometimes we're asked, um, did we have the opportunity to interview Nasser? Did we think about trying to get an interview with Nasser? And um, the truth is, we never really thought about it that way. Nasser um, is a character in the film. And um, when you stop to think about it, there's so many little pieces uh, of, of Nasser that comes through. And the beauty of it is it's always kind of coming through from the point of view of characters that are that are main characters in the film. You know, see this, this man who's had no spot on his records as far as we knew at that time prior begging us not to do that. So you know, I had to kind of keep reminding myself, it was like, don't feel sorry for him, you know, feel sorry for the victims, the survivors. And, um, but, but he made a, made a good play. The former team doctor for USA Gymnastics for 20 years is facing dozens of accusations of sexual abuse, including one from a former Olympian. The team of reporters from the Indianapolis Star published accounts from gymnasts who accused Nasser of sexually abusing them during supposed medical procedures. In that interview with Nasser's lawyer, he said that he had never performed an intravaginal procedure, which was really his downfall. I also love how Tim Tim Evans really shows his humanity in the interview piece just after the audio interview with Nasser. He, it kind of got to him. He talks about that. And I think that's a very unusual trait for a journalist, especially an investigative journalist, to admit 
that they feel those things. And um, it just, we always, we always, we, we had it in the film, we had it out of the film. We finally des decided it had to be included because it was so um, symbolic of this particular team of journalists who carried such humanity on their shoulders. 